Just a 
right and up, 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 please. <laughs> As you can see, I am a part of the instrument ensemble. All right, I'm so proud to be playing with the youth of the church. I'm glad they allowed me to play with them.
Amazing that Sister Carter chose for a devotional to read John chapter 14 because these two passages are usually read at funerals. And then I come with Psalm 23. Let me just advise you this is not a funeral. Today is a celebration. I said, Today is a celebration. Uh, the righteous king himself, his name is Jesus. And we have come today to celebrate the conquering king of Calvary, Jesus the Christ. Psalm number 23, I'm reading from the New King James Version, the New King James Version. You may read it a little differently than what you learned. I learned it in King James, so I have to read it very slowly, so I won't interject King James. Psalm number 23, New King James. When you found it, you discover these words. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. 
Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk about God got you. God got you. Let me begin this morning with a confession that I stand before you this morning breaking every rule and regulation of hermeneutics and homiletics. First of all, my first thing is that I chose the scripture based on current events. The first rule of hermeneutics is to choose a scripture that God has led you to, and then you interject current events in order to support what you're talking about. So I've just broken the first rule of hermeneutics by choosing a current event and then taking a scripture based on that current event. The second rule that, that I've broken is that many of you know this passage like the back of your hand. All right. And you're sitting here wondering this morning, why would he tell me some simple things that are found in Psalm 23? I've known that before I started the Sunday school. I, I've recited that every day of my life. Every time I got in trouble, they made me recite it. Every time, every time trouble hit, they made me recite it. The third rule of hermeneutics that I have broken this morning is that you usually choose your subject within the text. And you allow the text to speak to that subject. The subject is known as a big idea, and so you choose this big idea from the text. But here I am again, breaking this pattern of, of hermeneutics. But I think that I believe, I trust that God will speak to you homiletically this morning, and that we won't have to worry about the rules and the regulation after we leave. My current event is the confirmation hearing. Somebody said, here it is. Kataji Brown Jackson. As she sit, sit before, as she sat before, men who were less qualified than she is. As she sat before men in a woman who questioned her and antagonized her. The senator, Cory Booker, former, former, former candidate for president, said these words to her, God got you. He says, he says, he says, you are sitting where every African-American woman has sit throughout the ages, where you have to be much better than your counterparts. And you are sitting representing every African-American woman and how she has been overlooked for years. And my colleagues have sat and questioned you about stuff that really has nothing to do with your confirmation. It is a cis big Al, of, of a moment where they try to discredit you. It is a cis of a moment where they try to abuse you and oppress you. I don't know if it's because of her gender. I don't know if it's because of her skin tone. I don't know if it's because of her race. I don't know if it's because of her color. You do realize that race and color are different, don't you? You see, many of us in this room, about 95% of us in this room are of the same race. But we got about 75 different colors in this room. It's because of our background. 
And let me say to you, when I use the phrase men and women of color, I'm talking about you also. You see, Brother Gavan, Brother Gavan is, the, is the expert on historical African-American and, and Asian-American and Hispanic American. So I can't, no mis I can't make a mistake in front of him today. So when I use the word people of color, it is different from color people. If you're over 40, you know what I'm talking about. You know, water fountains that says, water fountains that said color only is different from people of color. So I come today because, because of such an agonized week. I come today because our youth and our young people need to know that life has changed a lot, but it hadn't changed very much. I come to let young people know all over this world today that every time you wake up in the morning, you have to be bigger, you have to be better than you were the day before because when you walk on the scene, the expectations that are put before you can devastate you. Let me say to uh, our members of the Hispanic race, our members of the African American race, our members of the Asian race, God got gotcha. you. Senator Cora Booker, he, he, he at least tried to quote a scripture. The, the, the president, the president, the former president, the former guy that was in there, the, 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 the guy that was in there before this president, he says, you know, you know, correct, you know, correct, don't you? He said, you, you know, too correct, don't you? You know, too correct. You can always tell when a person hadn't been to church in a long time because of their mannerism because, or hadn't been to church at all. Because of where they carry themselves, themselves, because they call Job Job. They call Psalm Palms. And they call 2 Corinthians 2 Corinthians. But today I want to pull our attention aside. Make sure that we understand real well that God has beautifully and wonderfully made you. You are different because God has made you different. You are different because God structured you before the hands of time began to go around. God made you who you are. Young girl, young boy, always be proud of, of who you were born to. Always be proud of what location you were brought up in. Always be a proud, be proud of, of what you had to go through to get where you are. I'm going to tell you, God got you. <laughs> when we look at the text, when we look at the text, we find, we find that God is writing by way of David. And David is saying to us today, David, the shepherd boy, David, who, who was uh, just as young as son, David, the little strony boy. Let me tell you, they thought that David would be nothing. They had already gotten him out there among the sheep, and they had resided that he will always be a sheep herder. But David compares God to the good shepherd. He begins, he begins by saying, the Lord is my shepherd. You see, it was David. It was David that, that had to rescue the sheep one day. And it was David that took a line out. It was David that, that, that wrestled a line to the ground. He was the good shepherd. So when he think about the goodness of God, he understands that God is the good shepherd. David says, the Lord, stop right there. The word Lord. The word Lord, and, and Brother Whitlock brought it out in Sunday school this morning. You heard him, didn't you, because you were here. Brother Whitlock says, this Lord is the self-existing Lord. This Lord is the eternal God. This Lord is Jehovah himself. He is the proper name of God himself. He is the only living and only true God. So if I messed that one up, Brother Whitlock messed it up. 
He says the Lord, when you see, when you see the Lord in all caps, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, he's talking about Ananias. He's talking about the eternal God. He's talking about the self-existing God, the God that was present before time began. I like to say that no one made him God. No one elected him God. No one selected him as God. He just is God. He always will be God. He always has been God. And he turned it past. He will still be God. You didn't have to legislate him to be God. He just always is and always will be God. This Lord God. David says, this Lord is my shepherd. He goes on to say, and I'm at the verses four through six. You know, at least I can, at least my, my hermeneutics is somewhat right because I'm trying to get the verses number four through six. He says, the Lord is my shepherd. This word shepherd means he's the, teach, the teacher and the tenderer of sheep. This word shepherd means that he is the herdsman. This word shepherd identifies God as our feeder. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's my feeder. You see, if you have an under-shepherd, he ought to be your feeder. You see, when people get ready to leave church, you know what they do when they get ready to leave church? They say, I'm no longer being fed. <laughs> That's the biggest crock of stuff on this side of heaven. <laughs> I am no longer being fed. Don't you know if you're going to go to a bonfire, you need to take a stack of wood yourself. You need to make sure that you come to catch a flame. So this Lord, this shepherd is our feeder. He, he describes him as our feeder this morning. He's the one who feeds us. David, David talks about the sheep. The sheep cannot live without being fed. That's why I'm wondering today, I'm wondering today, are people really being fed? Because you cannot live without being fed. He says, he is my feeder, and I shall not want, I will not want, I cannot want. The word want means that I'm without lack. There's no lack in me, because the Lord is my shepherd. The self-existing God, he is my shepherd. The self-existing God, he's the one who keeps me and blesses me. He's my feeder. I have no lack. It also means I have no decrease. Regardless of where I am today, regardless of where I've been, regardless of how things are going for me, I have no decrease. And it looks like we're decreasing. It looks like we are regressing. It looks like we're going backwards and forward. But the, the psalmist declares we have no decrease because the feeder, the Lord, the great amazing God, the self-existing God, the eternal God is our shepherd. So I have no want. I have no decrease. I have no diminishing. This word means diminishing. It means I have no fail. I have no abase. In other words, I have no lesson. If God is, is your shepherd, let me just share with you. You may have some stuff that you desire, but you have no want. When, when the Lord is your shepherd, you may not have what you want to drive, but you have no want. When the Lord, when the Lord is your shepherd, you, she may not look like you want her to look, but you have no want. She may not walk and smile like you want her to walk and smile, but you have no want. When the Lord is my shepherd, I understand I have no lack, and because I have no lack, I will not complain. Don't raise your hand, please. How many of you complaining now about this? Don't, don't raise your hand. Don't, don't move. Don't flinch. Don't look around. Don't, don't move your elbow or anything. How many of you have complained about gas prices? Let me, let me just share with you. There's absolutely nothing in the world you can do about your gas prices. But pay it and pray for it. So you need to be paying and praying. Maybe it'll keep you out of some dark alleys sometimes. 
Maybe it'll keep you from going some places that you ought not be sometimes. Maybe it'll get you to sit alongside when talk to God sometime because the prices are out of control. Let me tell you, they, but, but now all these prices are out of control. <laughs> I mean, these prices are, are booming now. I mean, they go up 35 cents a day. And that's not for a full gallon, that's nine tenths. That's for nine tenths of a gallon. But guess what? Regardless of how high they get, you're going to continue to pay for it. Regardless of how high they get, the Lord being your shepherd, you're going to have no want. But I got a remedy for you. If the gas too high, get you a bike. I'll help you ride. <laughs> if, if the price is too high, I have a solution for you. You can go at least 20 miles and, and save 50 gallons of gas. The same car that cost $40 to fill up, now it costs $80 to fill up. So now I'm filling up two and a half times, or one and a half times, rather, every time I fill up. But every time I go to the station, I pop that car, and then if you use the car, they charge you 10 cents more. But guess what? Every time I pop that card in, I say, Lord, I thank you that my car won't bounce. Lord, I thank you that you gave money in the bank. Lord, I thank you for SSI. Lord, I thank you for jobs. Lord, I thank you for education. Lord, Lord, I thank you for another privilege to glorify you and not complain about you. If the Lord is your shepherd, you get to a point in your life where you say, God is my shepherd. I shall not, I, I'm not going to worry about a thing. I'm not, he's my shepherd. He, and because he's my shepherd, I have no want. There is nothing in my life. How many of you can say there's nothing in my life I just have to need? I mean, I just got to have it. I, I, if I walk out this door, I can't do without it. Let me tell you what you can't do without. You can't do without oxygen. You can't do without blood flowing to every extremity of your body. You, you can't do without your heart beating and pushing blood out. You can't do without inhaling and exhaling. Let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff we got a hold of that we could have done without. <laughs> stuff with other folk name on it, tags. With other, you can do without that. I'm a living witness. You can do without it. The reason why I know you can do without it, because I don't look for the name in the tag. I look for the price on the tag. <laughs> I wanted to make sure it fits. I, I want to make sure it doesn't sag off me. I want to make sure that it fits right. I want to make sure that it doesn't call people to stare at me when I'm walking along. I want to make sure it fits. Forget the name in the tag. Because Tommy Hill figured if he had known all the Hispanics and all the African Americans would wear his stuff, he wouldn't have made it so well. You better get you some for, for us, by us. You better get you some stuff that was made for you by you. And let me tell you, and even he went across the track. You'll get that when you get home. We have to understand if the Lord is our shepherd, we can recite it. We can say it. But do we live by it? Do we believe it? We are more concerned about what folk think about us. I told you I saw a guy the other day, 16-inch wheel, uh, wheel caps. I mean, 16, 18-inch wheel caps. I had to get out of my lane and let him come by. And I declare he did it for him, he bought it for me. And the reason why I can say he bought it for me, Brother Miles, is because he's on the inside, I'm on the outside. He wanted me to say, ooh we look at those hub caps. He wanted me to say, ooh, we, he wanted Sister David said, that's a shame. <laughs> in, in my day, we had baskets, but those baskets stood off about that far. And then when we, even when, when I saw a guy at the red light and he stopped and his wheel just kept on turning, I said, look what he bought for me to look at. <laughs> he came to a screeching stop at the red light and the wheel looked like they're still turning. He didn't buy it for him, he bought for me. See, so many people are in financial trouble, so many people in, in mental states because you're buying stuff for folk who don't even know you. And the, those ones who do know you don't even like you. And your friends that used to be your friends since you're riding now and they're not giving you a ride, they're upset with you. 
but when you got the Lord as your shepherd. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. You, you, you just know that the Lord is my shepherd and there will be no, no want, no need, no decrease. He says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. The word makes mean he causes me. He influences me. He, he urges me to lie down. But the God we serve, he wouldn't cause you, he wouldn't urge you, he wouldn't make you to lie down unless he knows that the pastors are pleasurable. He says he makes me to lie down in green pastures. This, this word lie down, this phrase lie down means that he makes me to crouch down. He, he makes me to recline. He, he makes me to stretch out. And let me tell you, the old saints used to tell you, when you get in trouble, boy, you need to learn how to stretch out on the Lord. You, you need to learn how to recline on the Lord. You need to learn how to just lay out on the Lord and stretch out on him. Folk don't talk like, like that in church anymore. We, we, we talk about, Lord, we need you right now. Come on right now, God. We need you right now. You need to do it right now. As if God is your, your spiritual bell hopping. If God is going to give you everything you need. And he, you don't give God time to work. You in a microwave situation. You want God to work right now. But the psalmist, psalmist declares that he, he influences me. He causes me to crouch down and to recline. He causes me to rest, to sit. Let me tell you, young people, sometimes you have to realize that it's time to just sit and do nothing. It's time just to, just to turn the music off. It's time to just turn the TV off. It's time to just turn Twitter off. It's, it's time to just stop your emails from coming. It's, it's time to just recline on the Lord. Sometimes I, I just walk in and, and whatever's playing, I either ignore it and keep going or I say, well, do we really have to look at this right now? Because the fact of the matter is, you look at Fox News, you'll go plumb crazy. I, I said plumb crazy. I mean, I mean plumb doggone crazy. You'll be, you'll be fighting battles that not even your battles. You'll be upset about stuff that doesn't even impact your household. I mean, if you look at if you look at the news, my mother-in-law look at absolutely no news, and she's always happy. I mean, she looked at absolutely no news, none. I mean, none at all. If somebody got shot downtown, you better tell her because she ain't she didn't see it on the news. You said it was on the news, baby. I don't watch that. And her attitude is pleasant. She doesn't worry about anything. If you ask my mama what, what went on, somebody got to tell her or she got to wait till the newspaper come out because all she watched is Matt Dillon. <laughs> I mean, I, she's just fascinated. I guess that's why my daddy had to go and get out of here. She's just fascinated with Matt Dillon. You, you, walk, you walk in the house, it's Matt Dillon in the middle of the day. And Matt Dillon does not go off, Brother Irvin, un, until midnight. She wasn't Matt Dillon. I mean, if Matt Dillon didn't shoot him, she doesn't know who got shot. <laughs> she has no worry. She has no want. God makes us to lie down in green pastures. This word, this phrase green pastures mean the inhabitation. It is, it is, it is the house. It is a pleasant place. It is the abode of God. Let me tell you, when you're with God, God got you. When you walk with God, you, you need to just tell God, God, I need you. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day, Lord, I need you to guide me along this narrow way. Lord, I need you. And then make yourself available to him. And when you make yourself available to him, he is right there. Now, everybody hating on President Biden. Because he told what we've been trying to say all along. What, because he said that somebody needs to make sure that President Putin no longer leads. If you listen to the saints from the church, they'll take it even farther. You see, he has to be politically correct. But some of y'all have already said they just need to take him out of here and win this war. And, and, and get, if you get rid of him, you cut the snake off by the head. Some of you have said that. 
The fact of the matter is, God make places pleasant for us. He, he, he allows us, he, he makes us to lay down in green, tender grasses because he's our shepherd. And because God is our shepherd, we have no want. He says he, he leads us beside the still waters. This word lead is a different form of lead from the, the one that's found later on in the verse, in the chapter, in the, in the number of Psalms, rather. This word leads means he sustains us and he carries us. He, God, God knows how to carry you through. And right now, we need the Lord to carry us through. Even before Ukraine was invaded, we needed the Lord. Here we have a group of idiots who vote on our insurance, but they don't have the same insurance. We have a bunch of guys that's so old and decrepit, they need to be at home somewhere. And they just keep on putting them in office over and over again. And they're real scared now. And the reason why they're afraid now is because too many of you getting in power now. I mean, you, you getting in power now. Too many of you are speaking complete sentences now. Too many of you are moving into, into gated neighborhoods now. We got to stop, so we're going to read. It's a great time to redistrict now. It's a great time to cut this off and make sure that when they vote, it's all popular in the red states. But don't you know, God got you. I, I just stopped by on my way to the rapture just to let you know that God got you. So he says, he leads me beside the still waters. This word lead means he sustains me. He, he runs with sparkles. In other words, God gets joy out of leading you. God gets joy out of us being, being followers of Christ. He, he leads us. He leads us. He wants our lives to be lined up with his principles. And he wants to lead us because he knows how to, how to protect us and sustain us. Because he's our good shepherd. It leads us beside the still waters. The, the fact that the waters being still, they're quiet, they're comfortable, they're eased, and they're restful. These are still waters. And let me tell you, the waters are not still, but God leads us where they are. Are you with me? This world is like a raging flood. The Bible, the Bible teaches, the Bible teaches that when the enemy comes in like a flood. God shuts him down. When, when the enemy comes in like a flood, God takes care of us. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God knows how to quiet down the flood. When the enemy comes in and he, he thinks he has you. When the enemy comes in and he thinks he has the best of you. When the enemy clouds your mind with stuff that you don't even believe, but you begin to consider. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against him. And when God raises up a standard, God comes in like a flood with the standard. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God raises up a standard against him, and he cannot survive when the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing, sovereign God is present. You just need to hang out with God. You need to hang, hang, out, hang out with God. Spend your time with God. Just leave that stuff alone. It's, it's killing you. It's destroying you. Walk with God. God has the best plan. And because God has the best plan, we just walk with him. Young girl, stop letting him tell you junk that he doesn't even believe. That line is old. That's an old line. Girl, where you going? Wherever you going, I want to be. They were saying that line in the 50s, wasn't they, Brother, Brother Dixon? <laughs> they were saying that line in the 50s. Heaven must be Mr. Angel because you're right here with me. Baby, keep walking. Girl, Coke must be missing the bottle because there it is right there. 
Let me just share with you. There's nothing new under the sun. You trust God and you won't spend your lives falling behind and getting up and falling behind and getting up. I'm telling you, people who ought to be further down the road are still going through the same old thing because they're not walking with God the shepherd. He leads us. He sustains us. He keeps us. The water is still restful and ease. See, this water, this, this word water tells us in the midst of a flood. He turns the flood, the flood into a gentle stream. I told you before, sometimes God calms his child. In the midst of a storm, sometimes God calms his child. But other times, God calms the storm. Now the question is, when do you want God to shut the storm down? Always, every time. God just, just calm the storm. Your word said, God, your word shows in Matthew chapter 4, your word shows that Jesus spoke and the, and the winds and the waves laid down like a baby. Now, God, I want you to calm this storm. But sometimes God let the storm keep right on blowing. And in the midst of the storm, he has to calm his child. Let God, allow God to calm you as a child because when he calms you, the winds can keep on blowing. But my soul is anchored. <laughs> and when your soul is anchored in the Lord, you don't care which way the wind blows. My soul is anchored in the Lord. He, he, he leads me beside the still rest of the water. He restores my soul. I told you, I'm, I'm trying to get to verse 4 and 6, 4 through 6. He, he restores. He, he reverses. He, he withdraws. He recovers. He gives back to me. Some of you have lost so much because you flirted with the devil. But we have a God who's the good shepherd who will recover for us. He will give us back the days and, and he will give us back the blessings that the kicker worm has eaten up. We serve a God. When there are no horses in the stall, when there are no, no stock in the, no herds in the stall, God will bless us and he will keep us and he knows how to bless us. Regardless, he will recover us. Regardless of what has gone on around us. He says he restores my soul, my soul, my very own person. One thing that Deshaun was, I wasn't there, I don't know. I don't, I don't have an opinion. But one thing that Deshaun Watson, two things that Deshaun Watson did. Now, I don't know if, if he, he has shown evidence over the years of being a Christian. The Clemson uh, coach always put Christ first. So he had to have some influence. He said, I want to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Let me tell you, if, if he had never done it, he had sense enough to do it then. He knew who brought him out. He, he knew who dropped the charges. And let me tell you, I've been guilty myself, but God dropped the charges. And my haters have to step there and watch, watch it happen because God has said no. The grand jury in heaven, in heaven said no, no loss. God dropped the charges. So the first thing he did, he said, I give honor to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and I'm thankful to him. The second thing he did that applies to the text is that he says, I got to come back and make my name great. And he says, I need to make my name better than what it used to be. Let me tell you, when, when God restores your soul, he makes you a person better than what you used to be. He, he makes, let me tell you, let me tell you, if you look at my history, my history is torn up from the floor. Up. If you look at my history, my history is all jacked up. All you got to do is ask my wife, ask my, my siblings. My, my siblings love to tell the story. They love to talk about, oh, man. I mean, I had my brand new fiance. Took her to Mississippi for the first time. And they, my siblings aired out all my dirty lunch. I mean, all of it. They, they told every last word. They said, they said he fought going to school. He fought coming back from school. And she said, well, if I had known him back then, I never would have had a word to say to him. I said, well, thank God. God dropped the charges. And they told him, they said, they said he never started a fight, but he didn't have a problem with closing it out. 
And they said, they said, well, well, he never, never started to fight, but he didn't mind throwing the, throwing the first leg. You see, because it's like this, Brother Whitlock, I was always the smallest one. And when I looked at him, I said, now, if he punches me first, that means he can take me out first. So when I decided and he made the decision that we going to fight, I couldn't give him the first punch. So I had to throw the first one, the second one, and the third one. And if he didn't drop in, I had to do a little kicking. Because I couldn't afford, Sister Hughes, for him to hit me first. I would have, I would have, woke up, would have woken up and said, what happened? So I didn't mind. And they, they aired out all my dirty laundry. They just told, they told it all. Thank God my person was good. <laughs> Thank God that my reputation was already good. Because she was talking like she was going to rock away. <laughs> but my person was good. My reputation was good. When he says he restores my soul, he restores my life. He restores my very being. He restores my person. <laughs> so every time my enemies, every time my, my haters, every time my used to be friends will, will talk about what I used to be, I would tell them, look, you looking at my past, I'm looking forward to a glorious future because my future is in the Lord Jesus Christ. He restores my soul. He, he leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. This word lead is different from the other lead. This word lead is the word govern. This word lead means that he, he straightens me out. This word lead means that God has divine authority and he has the ability to straighten you out. Let me tell you, when we grew up, before we got to know the Lord, we thought what mom and daddy said was sovereign. I wish some of the children these days would figure that out. I wish children these days would understand that God is sovereign. Because when we grew up, they, they used to have a commercial that says, when E.F. Hurden speak, people listen. I never knew who E.F. Hurden was, but I knew who Mathis Davis was. And when Mathis Davis spoke, the whole house stood in attention. I mean, as a whole house Stood in attention. He was very quiet. He was very mild-mannered. But when he spoke, he governed that house. He didn't have to make threats because threats were not a part of a... He didn't have to count one, two, I told you what to do. Three, four, shut the door. He didn't go through all that. He said it one time and everybody in the house, didn't matter who he was talking to, everybody in the house knew that they needed to stand in attention. So this word leads means that the shepherd governs us, leads us, and he disciplines us and he strains us out. He leads us. He leads us along the path. King James says pass. This, this word pass is ways and trenches. He, he leads us in the, in the narrow way, in the narrow trenches for his righteousness sake. Righteous means prosperity. God has prosperity for you. Stop turning them off. Stop shutting them down. He has prosperity for you. And for his name's sake means that he is one with God. Verse 4. As I walk, if I walk, when I walk, through the valley of the shadow of death, let me tell you, sooner or later, it doesn't matter how much you stay at home. It doesn't matter if you mess with people. You don't have to mess with anybody. Folk will mess with you. He says, as I walk, this word walk means to proceed, to, to move, to come, to go. And he says, as I depart, as I walk. It gives a sense, an idea of walking in weakness. You see, we get weak. How many of you get weak at times? I mean, you get you weak, get, get weak emotionally. Get 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 weak in your heart, in your mind. You you get you get weak in deep down in your spirit. That's why y'all y'all wrongly quote the scripture that the the, the 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 spirit is willing, but the body is weak. The, the, the flesh the flesh is weak. I mean, we just love that. When we want an excuse, we go grab that one. 
So in your weakness, as you walk through the narrow valley, this, this word valley, you see what the shepherd had to do. He would get on top of the hill and there will be trenches, a valley, a water that will run from the top of the hill down to the bottom of the hill. When they walked down there, when they walked down that way, the water flowed down to where the sheep were. Let me tell you, God is willing to bring the blessings to you if you're willing to follow the shepherd. In the midst of a dark valley, in, in the midst of a shadow of death. Now realize this, it's not death. But it's a shadow of death. It's an image. And when you walk out this room today, there's a beautiful sunlight today. As you walk, look to, to your east or to your west or to your north or south, depending on which way you're walking, there's going to be a black image on the ground. And some people are scared of their own shadow. Whenever I walk in the room and I say, well, you better start living right because you start living right, you won't have to jump every time something happens. It's a shadow. The devil wants to display a shadow in your life. Judge Johnson is dealing with a bunch of shadows. She's dealing with folk that they, they will recognize somebody who's not half as qualified. They will recognize, and they, they have to admit, they are not qualified. Now, I never understood that. I, I never, ever understood that, Sister Jones, how, how they, can, they can put unqualified people to say that other folk are not qualified. I mean, they take folk who, who don't do anything but just troublemakers. I mean, they, they just start trouble. If it's something that's not particularly associated with their party, they want to make sure that you understand that I'm not for them. Mitch McConnell needs to go roll over somewhere. He, he looked like he, you can just touch him. Bam. Ted Cruz just out of order. Everywhere you go, they videotaping him. He, he got troubles with everything. Talking about when he walks through the airport, people just glad to see him there. They weren't glad to see him there the other day. They left, his, they left him. We have to get to a point to understand that in the midst of all the trouble around us, God has a way of blessing us in spite of what our enemy does. He says, he says, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me. God is with me. God is with me. I, I just got to, I got to tell you this, uh, uh, Brother Dixon and I had to fight a battle together. We, we had to fight a battle together, and, and I was really part proud a brother Dixon that day when he said, we going in with God on our side. And he said it with an attitude. <laughs> all of a sudden, I saw a man at a different level. I, all of a sudden, I want to claim him as a new beginning member. <laughs> all of a sudden, I didn't have any more issues. I mean, all of a sudden, every issue we've ever had just faded away. I said, that's a member of the New Beginning Church right there. And the moment he said that, the mediator said, okay, I better go back here and talk to them because we're, we're not getting anywhere with these two fools. They're going to ride this, this, this Lord card. They're going to ride this God card all the way in the court. So as a mediator, I got to sell this thing right now. And because we stood for the Lord, came back, and we got more than what we asked for. Let me tell you, we shall not want. If we walk, if we walk with the shepherd, in the midst, and, and it looked like, I mean, they had gone and gotten lawyers, and it's just us two dummies sitting there. We ain't even have sense enough to get a lawyer. We, we, we ain't paying no money for something. We know God who has blessed us. We, we just sitting there. And even in person. And then the enemy who we had to, the, the, the opposition to, wouldn't even show his face the whole time. He's sitting behind the Zoom black screen after he knew he had done the wrong thing. Brother Dickens called him flat out. <laughs> flat out. So I, I think I can go to battle. I got I to put him to the test one more time, and then I can be assured that I can go to battle with Brother Dixon. So we have to understand, in the midst of our battles, in the midst of this steep, narrow goal, Though I walk through the shadow of death, I will not fear. I have no fear. 
Judge, Judge Brown was calm as they tried to tear her character down. You look, look, young people, you only have your character. You have nothing more than your character. And some of these parents need to start telling children, just like daddy used to say, before you go out that door, I mean, I hear it every day, two, three times a day. You need to remember you are a Davis. You, and then he start calling names as, as you walk down the street. Then you're not a Weeks. You're not a you're not a Nixon. You're, you're, you're not a Collier. You are a Davis. And because you are a Davis, I want my name good when you show back up at this house. We need to start telling our children, look, you're messing up my name. Stop and, and then some people name their children their very name after them. It's that, oh, Lord, he got my name. <laughs> we have to get to a, a point where parents are no longer afraid of their children. I mean, we got so many parents that shake and, and, and fall apart when their children say something. In my day, when, when my mom and daddy said something. It was over. We didn't even have the privilege to say, why not? We didn't have the privilege to say, mm. We didn't have the privilege to clear, you clear your throat, that's disrespectful. Oh, you, oh, 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 you, uh, what? But we got children that tell their parents, they are disciplining their parents, and the parents do whatever they say do. And the cops have scared them. You, you can't touch him? You, you can't, you can't, you, but I can tell you some stories, though. I, I can tell you some stories to make you get off me. That's the show. And one thing about it, they will tell you in a minute, I brought you into this world. It's my responsibility to take you out of here. And they, they, they meant it. They, they meant it. They, they will plant you. I've seen cases, not in our household, because we, we were already warned. I've seen cases, mama driving down the road, not my mama, somebody else's mama. We sit in the back seat of our friend, that boy said, bam, she just keeps driving. Amen. We have to get to a point where we fear no one but God. And when we fear God, we fear our parents. We have respect for them. We have reverence for them. He says that I will fear no evil. I will fear no wickedness, no, no misery. I will fear no Depression, no oppression. He says, God is with me. I'll tell you something, Sister Nan Law, when you take God with you, you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear. You see, when I grew up, I didn't have a big brother. I was the big brother. But my cousin lived and grew up with us. His name is Rico Wilson. And whenever I showed up, if I had any problems, and Rico was around. He didn't have to say anything. He didn't have to do anything. He just showed up and said, man, what's going on? And they scattered. When you walk with God, and when God walks with you, your big brother Jesus is on the scene. And when God is with you, you don't have to see that and have to say a word. He just shows up for you. He just shows up. He, he doesn't have to say a word. He says, God is with me. His rod, his rod, his authority, his sovereign. God, this rod is a mark of God's authority. And his staff, his stick is used for support. His walking cane. There are some people who need a cane to walk on. They, it's their support. It's, it's their support. I, I broke my leg, played 12 years of a, a baseball with no problem, no injuries at all. Start playing in a church league softball game and broke my leg. I mean, I'm, I'm playing with guys throwing balls 80, 90 miles an hour, running into bases, sliding. I mean, never a dashing. I mean, like I, I was just 36 years old, I broke my leg playing church softball. But I had to get the crutch. Support. Everywhere I went, that crutch went with me. Before I stepped down, that crutch had to, had to get the flow first. Let me tell you, the God we serve, he has a rod. And this rod is his sovereignty, his protection. He has a staff. And the staff helps us to walk and to move. 
And it is our support. It says, they comfort me. So everywhere I go, he, he comforts me. He, regardless of what I'm going through, regardless of what the boss says, regardless of what, what the wife says, regardless of what the husband says, regardless of how the children act, he comforts me. Meaning he consoles me, he eases me. And then when he comforts me, he avenges me against my enemies. He takes care of me. He avenges me against, against my enemies. And there it is, verse 5, it says, He prepared the table in the presence of my enemies. When God prepares your table, baby, when God prepares your table, dude, when God prepares the table, he doesn't just go set up a table. God performs a whole banquet just on your behalf. He says he prepares a table. He prepares a spread out. He prepares a meal. He prepares a banquet in the presence of your enemies, your enemies, your oppressors. He prepares it in their presence, right in there. Right. He doesn't wait. To, you know how some folk wait till you leave to start talking about you? They wait till you leave to start saying, man, I was with you all along. But the God we serve, he doesn't wait till your enemies leave. Right while your enemies are attacking you, he prepares a table in the presence of your enemies. That's what Senator Cora Booker did the other day. He, you know, stuff that he said is usually said in the back room in the dark. He used words like white folk. He used words like black folk. He, he used words like the Bible. He, he encouraged her. Let me tell you, she wasn't crying because they had beat her up. They, she was crying because she had the ultimate support that she needed. She was being consoled. She was being, somebody needed to hear. And the, the rest of the Democrats tried to pull her up and, and build her up. But when Cora Booker started speaking, he said, now, I'm going for broke. And let me tell you, if you have a friend that's going through you need to be the one that consoled them. If you have a family member that's sick, you, you need to be the one that consoled them. If you have a person that, that is dependent on you, you need the one who should be the consoler in chief. Finally says, he says, he anoints my head with oil. He takes the ashes away, takes my sorrows away. The oil pours upon my head, meaning he gives me riches to grow in fatness. He says, when he anointed my head with oil and my cup runneth over, it says that we have great joy. Let me tell you, after that hearing was over, it doesn't matter how they vote. You, you know that the, the, the Democrats can't agree on anything, so you can't depend on them. I mean, they may have a majority, but, but, but they'll come up with some stuff. Let me tell you, Republicans agree on everything. And it doesn't matter if it's right or wrong. They're going to agree on it. Some of them have already come out and said the night that President Barack Obama was elected the first African-American president, they already said, we're not going to let any of his stuff. He hadn't put the first bill on the table. Hadn't, done, hadn't written up any legislation. They said, we're going to make sure that he gets nothing done. Now, here we are. The whole world is looking on the fringes of World War III. And they're trying to tear down one of their own. Let me tell you, folk will let you down. Folk will turn you off. Folk will not do what they say they're going to do. Folk will not give you joy. People will disappoint you, but I thank God for verse number three. And I thank God for verse number six. Verse number six says it like this. Surely, truly, goodness on one side, mercy on the other side. They follow me all the days of my life. He says, surely, goodness, goodness is favor. Goodness is welfare. Goodness is goodness. Goodness is pleasure. He says, surely, one of these days, it doesn't matter when. See, God is, is a patient God. He says, goodness 
will follow me. And then he turns around and says, mercy. Let me tell you, mercy pleads our case. It, it, mercy is, is kindness. Mercy is beauty. Mercy is faithfulness. We serve, I told you last Sunday, we serve a faithful God. He, he is there when we don't really need him there. He's there waiting on us to ask him something. He is there because other folk are, are shooting at us. He is the merciful God. He is the God that gives us what we don't deserve. Let me tell you, it's amazing grace that he gives us. Let me tell you, when he gives us amazing grace. Ooh, I used to wonder why the senior saints back home used to get to crying and slang and snot every Sunday that they start singing it was God's amazing grace now I understand better now it's, it's God's grace, it's God's loving kindness that, get, that blesses us God blesses us with good things we don't deserve, it's, it's unmerited favor and then it talks about mercy, let me tell you when you talk about mercy you deserve judgment you deserve injustice you deserve to be offended, you deserve hell but God through his mercy does not give us what we deserve. He rescues us in spite of us. He says that, that goodness and mercy follows us. Now when he says follow, he, he's not talking about following. It, it says follow. This word follow means it pursues us. The word follow means that, that it, it pursues us in a, in a very vehement way. This word follow means that he comes after us. He chases us. Look at God, the shepherd. The shepherd, the good shepherd, is chasing the sheep so he can bless the sheep. And all you got to do is stop running so he can pour blessings upon you. The good shepherd is chasing after you. He's running after you. He's trying to bless you. Goodness and mercy is following you. That means it's chasing you. You just got to walk with the shepherd. You got to trust in the shepherd. This word follow means that it's chasing you. It's running after you. It's trying to catch up with you. Goodness and mercy is trying to catch up with you. And you're doing something stupid with some stupid person. Stay with the Lord. Trust what he said. Keep his commandments regardless of what goes on. Stay with the Lord because his goodness and his mercy is following you all the days. Of your life, and you will dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. You don't have to wait till you get to the other side. <laughs> you can dwell in the house. The song, the songwriter said, "Lord, we welcome you into this place." It's not talking about this building. <laughs> the songwriter is talking about He welcomes you. Lord, we welcome you in this place. We welcome you in this place, Lord. We welcome you in this place. We have to welcome God in our hearts. And goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. Every day of our lives. And he says, forever. Forever means eternity. Forever means no. Forever means that regardless of what you're going through, goodness on one side, mercy on the other side, will chase after you all the days of your life. Jesus set us up over 2,000 years ago. He took a tree, marched up Calvary's hill, died on the tree. Mean men killed him. They took him off the tree, laid him in a barber tomb so that goodness and mercy would follow us all the days of our lives. Preacher back home would say early, that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He did it for you, sheep. He did it for you. The door is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. The door is open. If you never confess Christ as your Savior, this is your moment. You ought to try Him. Come to Jesus while you got time. Come to Jesus while blood is yet running warm in your veins. Come to Jesus while you still have a mind. Go ahead. Go ahead and Make up your mind. The door is open. He will make.
break your life. Come on, come on to Jesus. He, he, will, he will take care of you. Come on, come on. While, while you got time, the door is open. The door is open. The door is open. Just knowing Jesus. It sure has. It sure has. It sure has. It's paid off in my life. Come on, come on. Come on to Jesus. Wow. Why you? Why you have time? Yeah. Yeah, Lord. years ago Jesus died for your sins they buried him in a borrowed tomb and early that third day morning he rose from the dead just repeat after me and invite him into your life say Lord Jesus I believe that you are the son of God I believe that you died for my sins I believe that you rose from the dead Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe if you pray this prayer, you're now born again. When you die, you're on your way to heaven. If you are without a church home, I recommend the New Beginning Church. The door is open. You can come by and join by letter, by Christian experience. Or you can just walk down the aisle and you can hold your hand up and you can join online. Whatever you want to do, just join the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the center of attention and the main attraction. Yeah, this has paid off. Paid off. Yeah. Just knowing Jesus. Sure has. It has paid off. It's paid off. Yeah. He'll go with you. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. Why don't we thank God for who he is and what he's already done. We serve the awesome and the amazing God.
And we thank God for who he is and what he has done. It is now offering time. It's time to give to the Lord. Through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts, it is time to give to the Lord. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. Way up high and you will be served. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. opportunity to give to you. We ask you to bless every giver. We thank you for money. We thank you for increase. We thank you, Father God, for jobs. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us with this privilege of giving. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. We'll ask this side to stand, please. Come forth and bring the Lord's tithes, offering and sacrificial gifts. to stand please follow first impressions from the rear to the front bring forth the Lord's tithes offering and sacrifice is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com is our Zelle account if you want to mail in your, your gift you can do so by mailing it in to P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Missouri City, Texas P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Father God we thank you for these gifts in Jesus name Amen and thank God. Amen. Amen. We will recognize our visitors. If our visitors will stand, tell us who you are, and uh, so we can say hello to you. Amen. Amen. Ask this visitor to let us know who she is. Okay, Wanda K. Lawrence, Carolyn's cousin from Memphis, Tennessee. New Home Missionary Baptist Church, Pastor Helton. Pastor Sherman Helton is the pastor. Pastor Helton preached here for our family and friends day. And so we're glad to have one of the members of the New Hope Church here. Um, can you stand up again, Sister Lawrence? I just want to tell them, since gas prices are so high, Sister Irvin, since gas prices are so high, she hadn't ridden a bike in 50 years, and yesterday she rode 13 and a half miles. <laughs> Amen. So we have no excuse about gas prices. Amen. Well, ask this, this is my brother right here in the middle, and this is my sister right here to stand and say hello to us. These two young people here, the ones that are looking at me like me, yeah, I did those two to stand up and say hello to us. Amen. Good morning to the church. My name is Alfred Evans. Good friend of Matthew Davis. For years, years, and years. Glad to come in today and uh, talk with you and uh, announce that uh, we would like to uh, decide that our, our wedding. 
Boy, you trying to make me dance on Sunday? Good God, come on, give me a listen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Y'all just don't know how long I've been praying for this, this moment. I've been praying, begging, struggling, asking. So I'm so glad. Say something to us, Sister Mitchell, that's about to be Sister Alfred. Amen. Sister Alfred, brother. Alfred Everett was one of three of my first uh, co-workers when I came to Houston 36 years ago. He and I worked together in Lynn Resources in Western Geophysical, and, and uh, he was he was my lead man. And we're just so glad to have him back in in the house of the Lord. And, and her mama and his mama been praying, and I've been supplicating. <laughs> and now we. Uh, we at that point, amen? amen. Now look, y'all, point your hands right toward them right now and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, in the, in the name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen. We're just so glad that they've made that decision and they're going to make it public. And, and that's how you make your mom and your daddy proud. Do, you do what God has asked you to do, and we're so glad to have them with us today, amen. Amen. That's our first impression ministry to stand. Our first impression ministry. Did y'all notice anything about our first impression ministry today? Yesterday, last year, last week. Y'all see our first They have on the raw blue NBC colors today. Amen. Our first impression ministry here. We will get, get to meet with them after church today. And we are we're making sure that you are you are firstly impressed as you walk through the door. Our first impression ministry handles our ushering our parking lot attending, as well as our greeting. So we're glad to have the First Impression Ministry in the Royal Blue today. We're so glad to have them. We thank God for, for this opportunity to, to be a part. Thank you again to our visitors for visiting with us. Thank you for being a part of service. We look forward to, to uh, working and, and doing great things together in the Lord. Amen. Please, ma'am, please, sir, keep all, all of us in your prayers. Let's keep each other. In, in our prayers as we move forward and uh, we're going to be doing some things uh, now that we are completely back in session we are completely back in session here we want everybody to come back to church amen i said we want everybody everybody we want everybody to come back to church we want to uh, pack the place out we're still wearing masks and still checking temperatures we want everybody to come come back to church so we were going to put some things in place and we're asking the men to lead out. We're asking the men to lead out. So you'll be getting called. Every man that's in the house and every man that's not in the house will be receiving phone calls. We want the men, in the Bible, the men led before, before the people and before God. So we're asking the men. We're asking the men and the boys to show forth faithfulness to the Lord. It takes a good man to, to teach a boy how to be a man. And it takes a good man to show a girl what they expect in another man. Amen. So we want the men to lead out. And so we're going to be putting some things in place very soon to uh, to recruit men. And we want men everywhere we go. We want men every time we get together. We want men to populate the pews on Wednesday night for Bible study. We want men present. It would be a, it would be a sad day if someone walked in this room and terrified the sheep. And there were no men in the house. Amen. Uh, regardless of my background, I can't handle all of them by myself. So we want to populate the pews. We want to populate the pews with men Wednesday nights. We want men to come to Wednesday night Bible study. We want men here at 845 on Sunday morning for Sunday school. We want men. We want to recruit men to be here. 
I'm not talking about in shifts. I'm talking about every Sunday. We want all the men here at 845 for Sunday school. We want all the men here at 7 uh, p.m. on Wednesday night for Bible study. And certainly we want men at 1030 to be in the, and to flood the church. Flood the church. Do whatever you got to do on other days. We want men to lead out. I think the women want men to lead out. Now, you, you can't complain about a woman being overbearing if you're not leading her. Amen? It takes a spiritual man to lead a spiritual woman. Y'all hear the women saying amen? It takes a spiritual man to lead a spiritual woman. If you're not spiritual, and if you're, in, you're not in Sunday school, if you're not in Bible study, and you're not attending church, take all the excuses off the table and show up. We want men here. We want men to lead out and be the leaders of our household, the leaders. And if you don't have a wife, come on in and lead, lead children and be examples for children. We want to teach boys how to grow up and be men. We have too many weak boys, and it's only because nobody, no one has invested in their lives. So come on, let's make it happen. We want the men to lead out. And so brothers, don't get upset when your wife says, you know, you heard what Pastor said. Uh, and then wives, don't nag him. Just call me and I'll call him. Amen? Amen. Won't we stand to be dismissed? for blessing us and feeding us. We thank you for sustaining us and protecting us. We thank you for setting a table in the presence of our enemies. Lord, we thank you, Father God, that goodness is on one side and is chasing us down. We thank you that mercy is on the other side and is chasing us down. We thank you, Lord, for all that you are, all that you've done, and what you're going to do. Lord, we ask you to dismiss us from this place but never from your presence. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling, unto him the only wise and only true God, unto him be power, be glory, and dominion. Until we meet again, let us sing together. Amen. Amen. Our mission and vision statement, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world. As we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw men unto me. John 12 and 32. God bless you. You're dismissed.